Virgin Hyperloop, as I just said, is creating the first mode of mass transportation in over a century. And I suppose it's sort of like the motor car to the horse and cart. Um, and I can't even really get my head around what exactly it is. So could you please give us a bit of an explanation? For what the Hyperloop is? Yes. Well, how, yeah, what absolutely. Yeah, so the Hyperloop is, uh, as you would mentioned earlier, an, a totally new mode of transportation. First new one in over a century. And basically what it is, is you have these magnetically levitated vehicles, or pods is what we call them, that, that are... Um, kind of gliding down a track at super high speeds. And that track or that environment is enclosed in a tube and the pressure is taken down so it's nearly a vacuum. So what that means in effect is that you have these magnetically levitated pods going super fast in a low pressure environment. There is no friction of steel on track or wheel on road. There's no aerodynamic drag. So you're able to get up to those high speeds in a very smooth and seamless way. It's also, I should note, fully electric with zero direct emissions. Uh, and the overall experience is intended to be direct to destination and on demand. So we're talking about something that's better for the environment and better for the passengers. And you've been part of the very first passenger test on one of these um, recently. And, and I watched the video and it, it gave me so many goosebumps. Can you tell us what that was like? You, as I say, you made history, but what did it feel like um, uh, you were going 600 miles per hour? And can you sort of paint that picture for us all, please? Well, I should note that we didn't get up to full speed. We got really fast in a really short period of time, but we are constrained by the length of the test track. So um, my colleague Josh Geigel and I got up to about 170 kilometers per hour in just six seconds. Uh, it was a short yeah. ride, but it was, it was in a word, breathtaking. You know, there was, of course, the acceleration of getting up to that speed in such a short time. But there was also, I think for me, much more so just an acknowledgement of the magnitude of the moment. Uh, you mentioned earlier that um, this, this whole journey at Virgin Hyperloop started just six or so years ago in a garage. You know, six, seven years ago, Hyperloop was a series of sketches. And then just a couple of months ago, Josh and I were riding in one, you know? So for me, that felt like such an incredible, remarkable milestone uh, for certain for Virgin Hyperloop, but also I, I like to think for society and for what it means about um, our hope for the future. It is amazing when, when people put their faith in new technology and 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 you want it to you want it to feel that that new technology also feels familiar and as well as feeling innovative, right. and that's what you do in your job. So um, how do you think you create something that achieves both that? And um, it must be a special kind of mindset and a special kind of skill to create that experience for something that has never existed before. Yeah, I mean, you touched on something really important, which is that it it absolutely does have to feel comfortable and familiar. The architecture is open and airy. There's natural light. There are plants. Um, the pod itself has organic touches. Um, you're not assaulted by screens in every direction. Actually, the technology underlies these kind of sleek organic finishes and only appears when you want to see it. Only It's only there to inform and delight. Um, mm -hmm. And so we're trying to, to take away sounds and reduce the pollution of noise and colors and lights that you experience. You know, I've been lucky enough to work with uh, some thought leaders in surprising fields, not only in innovation and design for passenger cabin, but also in sound design. And I've even consulted with um, experts in olfactory design, people who do smells, because there are all of these inputs that we get as humans, sometimes unconsciously, that impact how we feel in a space. My parents were engineers. Um, they're, they're immigrants from an Eastern European country. They're very grounded. 
Uh, and when I pursued a degree in psychology for my undergraduate studies, they were kind of like, what is this fluffy stuff? You know, <laughs> this is my, this is kind of like my little secret um, at a very engineering heavy firm is that I did study psychology and I, I really credit that experience with helping me understand the ways in which we are moved and motivated by things that we are not always fully aware of. And mm -hmm. so my hope is to use those inputs like um, form factor, color, lighting, sound, even smell to create environments and experiences that are genuinely positive and comfortable for passengers of the future. Yeah, that's really exciting, especially with something new where people might be slightly apprehensive when they're, when they're using it for the first few times to try and think of using all the senses to keep people as relaxed as possible. I, I, I think that's a brilliant thought. And I love that you ask yourself the question, what's the future that you want to build? Um, and when you're doing this new futuristic type mode of transport, you've also really got to think about the responsibility that comes with it. Um, could you explain a little bit about that responsibility that you have when designing something so new? Absolutely. I think one of the things that's become clear as uh, cities grow more and more populated, more and more people are, are moving to urban centers, right? It's become clear that access to transportation is also access to opportunity, to jobs, to healthcare, to education. Um, and so we want to create something that's truly a mass transit solution, right? That's that's not just a solution for the 1% to go from the ski chalet to the summer mansion, right? This has to serve the people. And um, transportation has historically excluded people, um, not necessarily intentionally, but it, it doesn't matter. The impact is what matters. And so we have this incredible opportunity, but as you say, this responsibility to look towards the future and say, how do we make sure as many people are included in this vision as possible? I really want to bring empathy into engineering. And that's not to say that my colleagues, engineers writ large are not kind and compassionate people. They absolutely are. But I think traditionally they haven't been invited to bring empathy into their work. But I, I love everything you're saying there because I really truly believe that businesses need to be doing everything they can for the people that work for the business, um, making sure that their customers can make good consumer choices, but and and also look out for the planet. So what you were saying there about your, your people within the business and the customers, um, and at the beginning you were saying about how the Hyperloop technology um, has zero direct admissions. And I think that's uh, such a wonderful way to help make transportation um, climate neutral. I mean, how cool would that be if you could guarantee that every time you move somewhere, you weren't producing emissions? Can you explain to me how that works and, and what this could mean for the future of travel? Yeah, absolutely. So you're right, the Hyperloop has zero direct emissions, right? It is fully electric, you have this kind of clean green form of transportation that people can use to get from point A to point B at the speed of an airline. Um, I think there's room for an entire ecosystem of transportation to exist, but here we're offering like a clean backbone, like the spine to multiple journeys. Um, and if you have fewer cars on the roads and more people are using mass transit, then that congestion and that traffic is alleviated and the pollution goes down and everyone uh, is having a better experience on the micro scale on their commute, but the skies are bluer and the air is cleaner as well. Finally, I would just say there are parts of the world where the Hyperloop could actually uh, power itself in a sense by generating electricity using solar panels across the length of the track. So I think there are a lot of opportunities, probably some we haven't even fully explored yet, to create a net zero or possibly even a net positive um, at the speed of an airline, but at, at a, a tenth of the energy usage. It's 10 times more efficient. Um, it's not spewing emissions. 
And when you think about the impact that that could have on the planet, I think it's pretty profound. Finally, I would just say there are parts of the world where the Hyperloop could actually uh, power itself in a sense by generating electricity using solar panels across the length of the track. So I think there are a lot of opportunities, probably some we haven't even fully explored yet, to create a net zero or possibly even a net positive, um, a positively impacting uh, system. Well, my next question was going to be about what do you think the future of travel is? But I think you've just explained so much of that about how great about all these different modes of transport that are going to be um, non-pollution making and also just so quick and making just making life easier for each person. And I actually think it's quite good talking about this now when there's going to be quite a revolution on the, like how people work. Um, there's lots of people who might start to work more predominantly at home. They can live further away from the office, which means when they do need to go into the office, if there's a hyperloop to make sure they get there even quicker, you can live in nice green spaces um, and just get quickly to the office when you need to. It's about giving you back your time, giving you a broader array of options, whether you want to have the same commute time and live farther away where it's more affordable and you're closer to your loved ones, or you live in the same place, but you have more hours in your day to do what you want, to pursue your passions, to be with loved ones. That's what Hyperloop offers. That's my vision of the future and, and why I work at this company. That's what, that's what brought me here and that's what keeps me here. Sorry, you've sent shivers down my spine and I'm, I'm not going along like with everything that you've said because it's absolutely spot on. How amazing if we can make sure people have their quality of, of life in the workplace, but also they are able to do exactly what they want after work as well. And they're not, they're not um, feeling like they are beholden to a company. They can spend time with loved ones. They can do the sporting activities that they want to do. They can learn new skills and they've all got that you get a whole um, range of things that you can do in your life. Um, and, and it's not just all about work. And I, and yeah, I, and I love the way you sum that up so strongly. Exactly. I mean, you know, we can love our work and also not live for our work. I think this year has really taught us that mm -hmm. human connection is still so deeply important to us. And, and Holly, I wish that you and I were having this conversation in person uh, rather than over a screen. Um, so, you know, being able to connect people again once that's safe and feasible to do, uh, I, I think is a wonderful vision for all that it enables. So just before this interview, I reached out to my social media followers to see if they had any questions for you. And we received dozens and dozens of questions, but one of them really stood out for me. Um, Katie, who's also known as the uh, nurse mum at nurse mum on Instagram, she wants to know how accessible the Hyperloop system will be for people with disabilities. Um, like I'm talking to the right person here. Has this been factored into your design when designing the pods? Yes, I'm so glad you asked that. This is incredibly important. Um, it is factored into our designs. You know, I actually collaborated with uh, some of my my colleagues at Virgin Trains and and other companies to understand how transportation has traditionally excluded people with disabilities. And they told these kind of harrowing tales of of people who are in wheelchairs who there's a gap between the platform and the vehicle, and they have to navigate that gap with a wheeled uh, device or a walker. Um, you know, I, I think I think it's incredibly important that we ensure that this form of transportation is accessible to as many people as possible. And that includes people with reduced mobility, but it's not limited to them. So our current design does have uh, accommodations for a wheelchair. You can see it in the pod layout. Um, you can even see somebody in a wheelchair kind of wheeling onto the pod because we ensured that the, the platform and the pod bay and then the pod itself are all level. There's no gaps so that nobody nobody's wheels gets stuck, nobody trips, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we do have accommodations for a wheelchair in the pod design right now. Um, but I think that that's just the beginning. 
And I want to acknowledge that there is so much more that I think we can do. Um, accessibility is not just about whether or not someone's in a wheelchair. People who are elderly, people with families, people who are not that technologically literate um, all have different needs. I would love to develop and design a Hyperloop system that from start to finish is welcoming and accessible to people with all sorts of different needs. And so that could include being hearing impaired or visually impaired. I've talked with our sound designers about how we can use the other senses to create redundancies in things like wayfinding. How do you navigate through the portal? How do you find your pod bay? How do you find a seat? Um, so that if you can't see that well, are there sonic cues that help you get there? I'd like to create an environment that is welcoming to people who are not neurotypical because Virgin cares about creating products and experiences that are accessible to all people and because it's just the right thing to do. Part of my job is about dreaming the big dream, making that part of our requirements and handing it to the engineers and saying, let's work together to explore the realm of what is possible. I know that there are limitations, both technical and financial, about what might be possible, especially early on in our deployment. Um, but you know, there's that saying, and I am remarkably terrible at idioms, but it's like, shoot for the moon and you'll land among the stars. <laughs> um, that's what I'm trying to do here, is to say, let's imagine what is possible. Let us imagine the most ideal vision of the future and build towards that. And no matter where we land, it'll be better than where we are today. Um, hopefully not incremental change. You know, the promise of the Hyperloop is step change. It's, it's a totally new phase. Um, so I'm tired of like the little, the, the little improvements. Innovation and technology have transformed so many fields right? Um, medicine, communication, computing, entertainment. Uh, but I'm not seeing the passenger experience change that much. I just, you know, I feel like the seats are still getting smaller and the platforms are getting more crowded. Uh, I, I don't, I don't feel like my needs, my wants are anybody's priority. Um, it's kind of like the afterthought. Of course, companies want me to have a good experience so that I'll ride again or I'll buy again. But uh, what about developing with human needs, with the human at the center of the design from the beginning? And you do see that sometimes with like applications, phones, um, software, but I want to see it more in hardware and, and in the physical realm. So and actually, can be, and actually that can be easier when you are designing something from scratch as opposed to trying to tweak things that already exist. So I feel so thankful that we have you reaching for that moon because um, you're thinking about everything and all the ways that really are important, like what is right for the people. And then in that, you're going to end up with the best transportation system that you can. So thank you. It's exciting. It's 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 the future and it it does send um, like raises the hairs on my arms. Um, it's uh, it's just incredible. So thank you. Thank you for explaining it all to me today and also so brilliantly. Thank you so much, Holly.